Hello, you're listening to Hear This Idea, a podcast showcasing new thinking in philosophy, the social sciences, and effective altruism. In this episode, we talked to Isabel Bermecki, a fashion model and the world's first nuclear power influencer. We chat about why nuclear power should probably be playing a very important role in decarbonizing the world. So it's clean, as in emissions-free, it's very space efficient, it doesn't depend on the weather, and as you'll hear, it's really surprisingly safe. So when we think about how to phase out fossil fuels, which is obviously a huge task, it looks like nuclear should be in the mix in a big way. But nuclear energy also has a fairly bad reputation. Plus, these big infrastructure projects are not cheap, and so not only are very few new plants being built, but also perfectly functional plants are being decommissioned. So, as you'll hear, Isabel decided to use her platform on social media to do something about this bad reputation, and she started making videos explaining nuclear energy to a new audience, and hopefully correcting some misinformation. And so far, it seems to be working. Uh, We also chat about improving how we deal with radioactive waste, uh, how the risks from nuclear stack up against fossil fuels, and also how nuclear energy could become cheaper by using smaller modular reactors. So that's the context, and we started by asking Isabel how she got into learning about science. Yeah, so to get to that question, I need to explain a little bit of my background. So I was born in a very small town in southern Brazil. It's close to the border with Uruguay. And, you know, when most people think of Brazil, they think of like the beach and Samba and the Amazon forest. But the south is very different. It's all farms. There are these vast green fields, crops, and just a bunch of cattle. Um, in the winter, it gets actually pretty cold. So it's, it's definitely different than the Brazil people have in their imagination. Um, so I grew up there, very small town. Everyone is very Catholic in Brazil. I used to go to Catholic church every weekend with my grandmother. And I actually attended Catholic school up until I was like 12 years old. So like the most formative years of my education were in Catholic schools. And, you know, I believe that God created earth and, you know, he created all the animals and humans and the whole story in the Bible. And I remember having science lessons, but they almost always presented scientific theories and scientific information at the same level as creationism, Um, which to the mind of a child, you know, you start believing what your teachers are saying. So I pretty much believe that whole story. Um, Then fast forward a couple of years, I was about 17 years old. I got discovered to be a model, ended up moving to the United States. And one day, by mistake, (laughs) I ended up reading a book by Richard Dawkins called The Greatest Show on Earth. And it's a whole book about evolution. And I remember this day exactly. I mean, I I looked at the book instead of a box. It was a beautiful cover, like covered with flowers. And I honestly just started reading it out of boredom. I had nothing else to read. And I said, okay, this book looks interesting. And I remember sitting there and just reading those pages and thinking to myself, how could I not have known any of this? Um, And just learning about evolution and (laughs) <laughs> and that triggered me to go on Amazon immediately and search for books that were similar to that one. So that really, that book really led me down a path of, you know, just passion for science and down a path of knowledge and discovery that has been extremely gratifying throughout the years. That's such a fantastic story. And I can empathize with a fair bit of it. Um, now, what came next? Did you find more books that ended up influencing you in the same way? I did. I actually, um, the next book I bought was called Our Inner Ape by a primatologist called Franz De Waal. And it's this really interesting book about um, primates, other primates, and how their behaviors are similar to humans. And it touches a little bit on evolutionary psychology, which is something that I got super interested after reading that book as well. I had always been interested in human behavior and psychology. And so when I combined evolution and psychology, it was like a dream come true. And that's another goosebump moment. I remember, you know, being in my bed and and Googling. I actually Googled the words evolution, psychology, and I I came across evolutionary psychology. And 
went down that path a little bit. But just in general, the path of discovery and learning is so fascinating. You know, it's like this it's like whole new universes that you get to explore every time you stumble um, on a new subject. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, right? And I think the important thing for me, or the cool thing, is that the learning never ends. You'll never close a book and be like, yep, I've learned most of the things I was curious about <laughs> and there is nothing more I care to know. Um, <laughs> it's just an endless journey, which is great. There is no end. It's, it's like a sad realization when you realize that there's so many interesting things in the world that you never learned about. Right. But it's also gratifying because you know you'll never be bored. <laughs> yeah, completely. This is a tangent, but David Deutsch makes this point that there was maybe a time in history, uh, a couple of millennia ago, where you could really know all the important stuff discovered and written by other humans. But from that point onwards, it just was and is more or less impossible to know everything in that sense. Uh, and he has this kind of related thing about scientific progress and the reach of human knowledge, where I guess some people think there's maybe this kind of hard limit to scientific progress where you hit diminishing returns or something. But he's like, no, the reach of knowledge mm -hmm. is just boundless in this really mm -hmm. important sense, mm -hmm. right. which I like. I actually, tangent, but I actually love David Deutsch. Ah, brilliant, brilliant. Same. <laughs> yeah, I read I read his book, of um, his book, The Beginning of Infinity. It's amazing. And it literally changed, it literally changed my life. And it, it, it made me so much more optimistic about the future of our species. Yeah, completely. It did the same thing for me. Uh, shout out to David Deutsch. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about climate, obviously. But since we are also talking about your story, and maybe the answer is just no here, but was there a sense in which growing up in Brazil influenced the way you now think about climate issues? And I suppose energy poverty in particular? Yeah, so I, I grew up surrounded by nature. Um, my family has a you know, beautiful property close to the city with like a big waterfall. We used to go there every weekend, ride horses, get food from the garden and like play with chickens. So since I was born, I had a very strong connection with nature, which makes me care a lot about preserving the environment. Um, on the other hand, I also have an appreciation for a high energy life. And that's probably precisely because I grew up in Brazil. You know, we didn't have things like a laundry machine or a dishwasher or air conditioning or central heating. And I, I think a lot of people fail to appreciate how important these objects are in our day to day life. Um, they, they can sound a little bit like luxury items, but in reality, they are some of the biggest contributors to human well-being and women's empowerment. So, you know, laundry machines and dishwashers gave women more time to dedicate to their studies and career. And heating and air conditioning make people feel comfortable and, and in some cases can even be life-saving. So, you know, I have low blood pressure. So remember always feeling lightheaded and exhausted all summer and not being able to sleep because of the heat. So these are all things that have serious impact in, in people's well-being. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I mean, it's obviously still the case in many parts of the world and maybe more so the case over a lot of history where people just spent almost all their time and uh, especially women obviously doing things that we would take for granted that machines do as in we people who own dishwashers and washing machines um but you know technologies like the internet and stuff are a bit shinier and more exciting and so maybe this point just ends up getting really underrated and and now people think about it now people have free time to fight on twitter Exactly. Hashtag progress. <laughs> um, all right. So let's talk about climate change in general. And we should just lay out some of the problems, first of all. So maybe a place to start is to hear a bit about the breakdown of how much energy is being used to do different things globally. Like when I think of what kinds of things use energy, I have a vague picture of, you know, cars being in there and like electrical appliances and factories but can you say something about how that all stacks up? So right now, the global energy consumption is 173,340 terawatt hours. And one terawatt hour is equal one trillion watt hours. So that's just a lot, <laughs> a lot of energy. And 
energy is consumed by all different sectors, you know, primarily transportation globally. So that's things like like cars, ships, planes, whatever mode of transportation that, that uses energy. And then we have electricity, meaning using this primary energy to create electricity to power our homes and offices and buildings and appliances and all of that. And then we have industry, uh, which is manufacturing facilities and making stuff, basically making steel, cement. And then finally, we have agriculture, which is which is the last component. It's kind of hard to come across all the numbers and, and different sources will tell you different things, but those are in order. So meaning transportation uses the most energy and then we have electricity industry and so on. But yeah, it's just it's just a massive, massive problem that touches on every single thing we do as humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe this is stating the obvious, but presumably there's nothing wrong in itself with expending energy. So what exactly is the problem with where we're getting that energy from? Yeah, so the problem right now is that we're getting our energy from fossil fuels mostly. Um, still 84% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. And that's things like coal, natural gas, and um, oil. And of course, as we now know, burning fossil fuels um, not only causes air pollution, which already claims lots of lives every single year, but it also um, increases the average global temperature and is causing a bunch of other problems. And we call that climate change. So, yeah, exactly like you said, the problem is not how much energy we're using is where we're getting that energy from. And right now it's mostly from from fossil fuels, which cause climate change. Yeah, fantastic. And now looking forward to how we get out of this mess, um, there's this idea that there are really two broad stages here. There's electrifying and there's decarbonizing. Could you just explain what both those things mean? So I talked a little bit about, you know, climate change and, the, and all the different sectors that use a lot of energy. And electricity is a secondary form of energy, meaning it doesn't exist in nature. We have to use another primary source to create it. And those primary sources can be things like the sun, the wind, hydro, or, you know, splitting atoms like nuclear power. And so, so when people say we have to electrify, we just mean that we have to make everything that we can electric. So instead of using gasoline-powered cars, we should use electric cars, um, electric buses. Same for heating. Instead of using natural gas to heat our homes, we should use electric heaters. So we just need to get most of our things to be powered by electricity instead of coal, oil, or gas directly. But then, of course, we need the most important step, which is to decarbonize um, which is just to make sure that all of that electricity now comes from clean sources. So again, these are sun, wind, hydro, nuclear, and geothermal. There, there are some more, but these are like the main ones. So that's what people mean when they, when they say electrify and decarbonize. There's also huge gains you can get from electrification itself, right? Which is that these processes are often a lot more efficient. So I think one of the classic examples is kind of looking at electric cars versus uh, diesel cars, which precisely use, right? Um, electric cars use the secondary electricity energy, whilst um, diesel cars use, use primary energy. But a lot of energy just gets lost because through the internal combustion engine, you have heat, you have sound, you have all of these kinds of sorts of inefficiencies, which also means that um, you can actually get in some situations a lot more bang for your buck if you electrify. Um, so it's not just clean energy. Um, it's also that you need a lot less of it to basically be doing the same things. Right, exactly. It's just it's just better technologies all, all around. Yeah. Also, one crazy thing I learned from the new Bill Gates book was that if you look at fuel efficiency for cars over time, it's improved, sure, but only by a little bit over like the last 50 years and nothing like you know, Moore's law for computer chips or something. And then if you look at battery price and capacity and efficiency for electric cars, they're improving so much faster and they're not obviously slowing down. I wonder, I wonder if it's a physical limitation or if it's just that they're efficient enough so people don't need them to be more efficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a really good point, actually. And I think it might be something we, we hit on later as well when we talk about uh, like coal prices, right? Versus nuclear prices and, and the like, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Let's put a flag there for sure. Um, but okay, so that's the problem. 
and we've got this very bird's eye picture of the way forward. But like you said, there are lots of different alternatives to burning fossil fuels to get useful energy, right? There's hydro and solar and wind and geothermal, the whole gang. But we're obviously going to focus on nuclear power, right? So can you just tell the story of how you started learning about nuclear power and also how you realized it was something potentially important to lend your voice to? Hmm. So nuclear energy first came to my attention to, through Carolyn Porco. She is a planetary scientist who worked at NASA for many, many years. Um, so back in 2015 and 2016, she tweeted a couple of times about molten salt thorium reactors and how they were this incredible technology that were much better than you know current nuclear power plants and so on. And I remember being super curious about it. Um, but at the time... I didn't have the knowledge necessary to learn about molten salt thorium reactors. It was kind of like this obscure technology. It was really hard to find easy to digest information online. But from that moment on, I remember every time I met a scientist or someone who thought about climate change, um, I asked them about nuclear power. And the responses always seemed to be something like, oh yeah, nuclear is actually pretty good and we're actually gonna need it to solve climate change but the public perception is terrible. So behind closed doors, everybody seemed to agree that we needed nuclear power and that it was actually much safer than people thought. But nobody felt like they could, could they could voice their opinions publicly because of you know the bad reputation that comes with the technology. So that's when I, re I, I started to realize that in order to build more nuclear power plants and you know ultimately avoid a climate disaster, we would need a radical shift in how people perceive nuclear energy. And, and as I started learning about nuclear power in general, I realized how much of this negative perception was actually created by misinformation and the availability heuristic, this tendency to, to overestimate the, the risk of something happening just based on how many examples you can think about. So, you know, airplane crashes come to mind. And I think it's very similar to nuclear power in that you've had you know, this couple, handful of accidents that were very catastrophic, um, but compared to fossil fuels are still much safer. And But people tend to remember those events instead of focusing on the everyday winds of, you know, how many clean electricity and nuclear reactors have been creating for decades now. So I just saw that there was space for someone like me who doesn't come from academia or the science community to help clear out some of this misinformation and, and just spread the message in a fun and visually interesting and unusual way. Okay, awesome. There is so much there. Um, so one thing to talk about is just what is the case for nuclear, given that I imagine some people listening will associate nuclear power with some pretty dodgy things. And then there's this question of, given that there is a strong case for more nuclear power, where did its very poor reputation come from? Um, but okay, let's start with the positive case for nuclear power and all of its upsides. Um, so could you maybe say something, first of all, about just how fission works and also something about what advantages it might have over solar and wind, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nuclear power is different than solar and wind in that it uses fuel to create electricity, um, right? So Solar panels are just literally capturing the sun's energy and converting that into electricity. And wind turbines are capturing the wind's energy and converting that into electricity. And nuclear actually uses fuel. So it's a thermal power plant, um, similar to coal and, and gas power plants in that, in that it uses heat to create electricity. And the difference there is that coal and gas power plants burn coal and gas, respectively, um, to, to heat water. It's basically just like a fancy tea kettle. You're just heat, literally heating water to create steam to spin a turbine. And the difference with, between coal and gas and nuclear is that nuclear uses the splitting of atoms to create energy to heat water to, to spin a turbine. So... Nuclear energy, because it's not burning anything, is carbon free. It doesn't have any emissions. Um, that's why it's considered a clean source of energy. And you know, one of, I mean, now for to making to make the case for nuclear energy, I think that the biggest advantage that fission has over other sources of energy is really how dense it is. 
Um, and nuclear is the only source of clean energy that's reliable, meaning you can create electricity 24-7 independently of the weather. And that can be built pretty much anywhere. And like I said, because of the density of uranium, we can create a huge amount of energy in smaller spaces and using way less materials, which is you know, good news for the environment overall. One thing I want to pick up on on there then is um, on some of the, I guess, contrasts, as, as you mentioned, to solar energy and, and wind power. So you pointed out exactly right that, um, you know, there's this huge intermittency problem, which um, renewable energies have um, in that they're not very reliable and they're often only available where it is very sunny or it is very windy. But some people might say, okay, those are limitations, but, you know, we can try and overcome those. Um, Finn mentioned how there's these big developments in in battery storage. Um, you can also talk about just making energy grids in general more uh, interconnecting. So if energy is produced on the coast, it can go into the mainland. What would kind of be the case of investing in nuclear energy to complement um, like solar and, and wind as opposed to just going all in on solar and wind and just trying to fix the problems that it has? Well, because we don't know for a fact that it, that those solutions will work. Um, like there's theories that they might work, but we, we haven't done that, right? And I think we're talking about avoiding a climate a climate disaster and, and decarbonizing as soon as possible and doing so by you know 2050 and, and things like that. I think it's too much of a risk to to try and bet on a technology that has not been proven to to work to that level. I think that renewables are great for what they are. We start running into all sorts of problems when we start forcing them to become something that they're not, um, meaning a a firm source of energy, a a reliable source of energy. Um, And I don't think there is anyone who actually proposes doing wind and solar only. I think batteries are always a part of the equation. And then with batteries, it's... It's, of course, extremely expensive. So, you know, there is a a study that came out recently um, talking about California's decarbonization, path to decarbonization, and they analyzed all these different scenarios and already decarbonizing with solar, wind and batteries is more expensive than decarbonizing with, with solar, wind and something like nuclear, even considering like the most expensive type of nuclear. And then there's also all these other issues of like how many batteries we would need in order to to provide that grid balance. And does it even make sense to build that many batteries to sit there for, you know, a big majority of the year and then just kick in whenever there is, you know, a period of low winds or a period of low sun and then replace these batteries every 10 years. So I think there is a lot of there's a lot of unknowns and and there's a lot of other things that we need to consider um, before just jumping in on this, you know, let's go 100% solar, wind and batteries route. But equally, just to be clear, you're not saying that we should go the other way and go 100% nuclear, right? Not at all. Like, clearly nuclear is not going to solve every problem under the sun. But the idea is that it's underrated and should play a really important role. Um, but it obviously makes sense to have some balance of everything. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I don't even understand people who make the argument that we need this one solution. I think it's a little bit religious almost. You know, you need this one thing and it's going to solve all of our problems. It's not. Again, the challenge is huge. The challenge of decarbonizing our energy system is giant. We need to deploy an insane amount of clean energy in the next few decades. And we need all of it. And, and right now, renewables are cheaper and so I fully support deploying them as much as we can right now. But th- there seems to be consensus that we need something like nuclear. And I say something like nuclear because we need some some form of firm, clean energy. And that could be things like hydro, geothermal, and nuclear. So hydro, as you know, is geographically limited. You cannot build a dam in the middle of the country uh, where there is no water and elevation. And geothermal thus far has also been geographically dependent. There's now a lot of breakthroughs in geothermal technology, and we can get into details here, but there's a lot of really exciting things happening in geothermal. But again, this is still kind of far away. It's just the beginning of this this journey. And then in the nuclear, which we already have, we've already built a lot of these plants, and 
we've had them around forever and we know that they're very effective at decarbonizing the energy. We, we've done it before, um, right? When you look at countries like France and Sweden, they have deployed a very large amount of, of clean energy and significantly decreased their emissions. And it was all nuclear energy. We, we've already done it. So we, why not just repeat what has been done in the past instead of batting in this, you know, obscure and, and theoretical technologies? A funny thing, I think that's kind of worth noting, that the reason why France's like share of renewable energies is so high isn't actually much to do with like the environmental concern. It's actually that back in the 70s, they just didn't have um, a lot of coal or kind of fossil fuels to use, which meant that when the oil shocks happened and you couldn't rely on getting cheap oil from the Middle East, France basically went almost kind of all in on nuclear energy. And that's really paying off now when you kind of realize that it is actually really good to have these uh, non-carbon emitting sources of energy. But that, um, interestingly enough, didn't really come from an environmental concern, but much more from like a, an economical one, actually. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that a lot of countries that developed their their nuclear power plants back in the day were were not focused on the environment and were focused on just energy independence and, and other things like that. Um, but yes, it's t- totally paying off. I mean, France has 70% of their electricity come from nuclear and they have consistently one of the cleanest electricities in Europe and one of the cheapest as well. So they export a lot of electricity to other countries, including Germany, <laughs> who phased out of their, their nuclear plants or is phasing out of their nuclear plants and ironically imports electricity from France. So so say something about what's happening in Germany and these other countries where plants are literally being shut down and there's certainly no plans for building new ones. Now, if you've said there's an expert consensus for pushing in the direction of nuclear power. What's going on there? So famously, Germany decided decided to phase out of nuclear after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. And we know now, looking back, that after they closed a bunch of their nuclear power plants, their reliance on coal increased, and so did their emissions for the years following the shutdown of, of plants. And now, because of their investment in renewable energy and, and deployment of that technology, they've finally lowered their emissions. But we know that shutting down nuclear power plants always increases emissions. And, and I think that Germany, because it's such a powerful country in Europe, kind of influences the, the culture around. Um, so we see it all over now. We have Belgium um, announced last year they're closing all their nuclear plants by 2025. And I mean, they've publicly said that all of them will be replaced by natural gas. Which sounds good, right? But just to be clear, natural gas is not good. <laughs> well, yes, natural gas, let's call it fracked methane. Um, yes, so it's, it might sound good, but it's, it's actually really bad. And especially when the global conversation right now is about climate change and about how we have, you know, this many decades to, to phase out of fossil fuels and to decarbonize. It just seems like taking steps backwards. And, you know, unfortunately... Fossil fuels are cheap and they're easy and they're reliable. And so it's very easy for countries to fall back on them. Um, And we see that happening all over in the U.S. For example, we're shutting down five plants in the next five years. And these plants alone create more clean power than all of California's wind and solar combined. And California is one of the biggest, you know, renewable states in the United States. And as I said before, you know, historically, whenever nuclear plants shut down, emissions increase. Um, So it looks a little bit depressing in these places, I'm not going to lie. But, you know, on the bright side, there are about 50 reactors currently being built in 16 different countries, um, most of them in China, India and Russia. And the UAE just this week started operating their first nuclear power plant, which alone will provide about 25 percent of the country's electricity. So there are things happening, just not in, in Europe and, and the United States. No, and um, I mean, you're definitely so right about the problems with replacing nuclear energy power plants with, with fossil fuels. I'm sure I'll go like on a rant in this in, in, in the write up. But like the big thing in Germany, right, is that after you kind of shut down, there's now deals with the Russian government about Nord Stream, which isn't just a problem because it encourages oil, but it's also dealing or those making Germany's energy security reliant on, on Russia, which they haven't had the, the best historical relations with. And it's just involving a huge amount of corruption 
uh, just very like blatant corruption as well of like politicians or former presidents of Germany just very clearly now being appointed the heads of these committees and being paid ridiculous amounts of salaries. It's really, really like a, a dirty business and one that I think I just get so angry with. Right, especially from a country that is, you know, claims to be the champion of of the environment. It's just, it doesn't add up. And, you know, the main arguments against nuclear power today are cost and time to build. So there basically are no good arguments to shutting down existing safe plants um, that could run for possibly 80 years, which is what they're getting licenses for now. So there really is no good argument for shutting existing plants and invariably they lead to higher emissions. So you, you mentioned these two um, like prominent um, kind of counter arguments you hear about nuclear energy, and I'd love to explore these in a bit more depth. So maybe to start off with the cost one, um, you mentioned that one of the big advantages that fossil fuels have is not just that they're reliable, but also that they're really cheap. And I think one of the things we've seen in America, especially, is that actually fracking is really undermining the the kind of market for for nuclear energy. If you could just kind of uh, have a very like liberalized energy market, as you saw in in Texas and stuff, it's it's really hard for nuclear energy to compete. Can you maybe explain a bit about why that is and and what kind of solutions we might have to that? Yeah. So the the, the interesting thing about nuclear power is that it's actually a huge upfront cost. But then the cost of the fuel itself is very cheap. Um, and part of it because uranium is not that expensive, but also because, again, the density of the fuel, which means that you need to use less to create more energy. Um, but the problem really is that upfront costs to, to build a nuclear power plant can cost something like $20 billion. And and people look at gas and, and oil and all this existing technology already. It's existing infrastructure. All they have to do is just get more or build pipelines um, and also because in a lot of markets, and each state has a different um, regulation, but in a lot of markets, nuclear is not rewarded for being low carbon while renewables are. And so you have that extra challenge added to it. Um, but I mean, the cost argument is one that I think is a little bit misguided because obviously we're not accounting for the real cost of fossil fuels um, and the cost they cause you know, the damage they cause to the environment and all the, the cost in the future of cleaning up this mess. And then there's also the fact that, yes, nuclear power plants are expensive to build, but once they're up, they can run for 80 years and then can create electricity for, in some cases, 3 million people in a single nuclear power plant. And there's also the fact that there's nothing intrinsic to nuclear power plants that makes them so expensive. So they're not made of diamonds. <laughs> they're made of, of steel and cement and normal things like that. So it's all about really figuring out how to decrease the cost, which, you know, this is a whole new topic on its own. But the problem mainly in countries like the United States is that, is that each one of these plants is one of a kind project, right? So they build it once and then they take a break and then they build a different model in 10 years from now. So you don't, you don't learn by repeating it and you don't get efficiencies of scale. You're just literally doing this one giant project at a time. And then there's a lot of, a ton of like safety measures and, and regulatory issues that come with nuclear power. And a lot of those I think are great because they make nuclear actually safe. Um, they actually make nuclear one of the safest forms of energy. But some of those are are totally misguided and, and you know set up by irrational fears of radiation and irrational fears of nuclear power. So there's like obviously a lot of different things that contribute to the high cost, the high upfront cost of nuclear, but there are people trying to solve for that. So now you might have heard of small modular reactors. There, are you know, the whole vibe right now in nuclear energy, there are this new generation of reactors that are actually modular. So the different parts are made in a factory. They're going to be shipped in like the back of a truck and then just assembled on site. So their hope is that by serializing these designs, you can just decrease the costs. Now, of course, you know, a point that I would like to make is that none of this has been built yet. They're all still very much in exploration phase. Um, there are plans to build some in the next five years or so, but we're, we still have to see. Yeah. I love this point that maybe one of the reasons nuclear is relatively costly nowadays compared to other renewables could just be because we've built too few plants to really learn from and we've invested relatively little in the R&D. And then maybe the reason for that is this kind of 
short-sighted, self-fulfilling thing where it's like, oh, these plants are too expensive to be economical to build now. Plus, they're presumably kind of scary, as evidenced by all this strict regulation we've put up around them. And so they just stay costly. But the point is, the way you drive down costs is for there to be, you know, incentives to make the thing cheaper and then opportunities to keep making that thing. So yeah, if there's an upshot, it's that looking at present day prices is sometimes useful, but could actually mislead us when we're thinking about whether to invest in nuclear. Remember that this was the argument against renewables for decades, right? The argument against renewables for decades is that they were too expensive. And then people worked on reducing the costs, and there you go. Now we have renewables being cost competitive with fossil fuels even in some cases. So it's it's all about just building and, and repeating and trying these different trying these different technologies. But of course, we cannot do that if the public perception is still really bad, which is <laughs> which is why I'm trying to to change it. As you mentioned, um, solar power has seen like huge improvements in learning by doing, but that I think is also in large part easier to do because they are kind of smaller units and you can tinker from generation to generation. Like one of the, I think, stronger arguments against nuclear energy is just because they have such a long lifespan that once you build a nuclear energy plant, they really last, as you said, for 80 years and you're kind of locked into that technology for that longer period. And I think they take almost 40 years to kind of pay themselves off. And that one of the, the risks you, you see is that if you think energy prices are going to keep falling, either in a good way because of um, solar energy improvements or in a bad way because of kind of fracking improvements, that um, you might kind of be, be left in the dust on like a longer time scale if you're still relying on technology kind of 40 years or even 80 years in the, in the past. I mean, that's, that's a good point. Um, just to touch back on the, on the cost of solar panels. Yes, of course, the cost has reduced dramatically. But the truth is, you cannot decarbonize the system with solar panels only. So you have to account for the costs of all the other things that have to come with solar for you to be able to decarbonize your electricity system, right? So it's solar panels, and then it's a bunch of transmission lines, and it's a, you know, a super grid, and then there's all the batteries. So while solar panels themselves are, are very cheap, all the structure around that you need to allow for solar panels to do any meaningful decarbonization or not. And and as I said, you know, are in fact already cost competitive with expensive nuclear. So that's kind of where I am with, with the with the cost argument. Okay, I, I understand that the price of panels are, are themselves cheap, but you can't do that alone. No, I definitely agree. And you also have to kind of consider the fact that solar panels are only being used in kind of the most sunny areas at the moment, right? So even if you did try to replace um, through some ways kind of uh, all fossil fuels with, with solar energy, you're going to have to use them in kind of less efficient uh, areas at some point. And then that's going to uh, increase kind of cost somewhat. But um, that kind of feels like a like a different tangent. But just to kind of address some of the kind of common criticisms you you hear and to, to hear your response to them, Isabel, is um, the second point you mentioned about like time to build. And that feels very pertinent, especially from a climate change point. So you could say, look, we're in a climate crisis now. We need to get to a decarbonized energy system by 2050 at the latest. But nuclear power plants take an awful long time to build and they require a very intensive way to build as well. As you mentioned, kind of cement is used a, a ton there and cement is a, inherently a very kind of polluting material. There seems to be almost like a way that it might be really low carbon once we get onto this nuclear pathway, but just getting to there takes a long time and is, is just very energy intensive. Can you maybe address some of, some of those concerns? Yeah, for sure. So the slow argument is a bit a bit interesting to me because, um, you know, people have this perception that it takes such a long time to build nuclear power plants. Um, so in, in fact, in Pakistan, just a couple of weeks ago, they finished building a reactor um, with the help from China. From, you know, first day they started getting dirt off the ground to completing the reactor, it took them seven and a half years. Baraka, which is in the UAE, took um, 10 years to build. And even Volgo in, in Georgia, which is here in the United States, the only plant that's been built was started in 2013 and is, is delayed, but it's probably going to take, you know, 10 years to build or, or so on. So 10 years, yes, it, it, it's a lot of time. But if you consider that in this 10 years, you can deploy all the solar and wind that you want, it's not going to interfere with the build out of nuclear power plants. Just deploy all the renewable technology in the next 10, 15 years while building all these other nuclear power plants. And then by 2050, you can have, you know, a stable grid that is only with clean energy, but you have all these different technologies that complement one another. So... I don't think that 10 years is that is that big of a deal, considering that we need something like 
nuclear energy to provide that last, you know, 10 to 5 percent decarbonization in the grid. Um, and the other and the other thing is that, again, they last for 80 years while solar panels and, and wind turbines last between 25 to 30 years. Uh, so we need to replace all of those. And we're going to need energy forever, right? We're not going to, it's not like we got 2050, we decarbonize everything. Oh, we're not going to, we're not going to need any more energy. No, we're going to need energy forever. So if we can have something that's reliable, again, reliable, and that creates a, a huge amount of energy in a small space that is going to be there for 80 years, I think we should, we should be investing in it. That's a great point. And it occurs to me that even if you expect global population to level off, you still shouldn't expect energy demand and consumption to level off, which is a good thing, incidentally, right? Because energy use is a pretty good indicator of development. So we're always going to need new solutions, more energy. And it makes sense to think quite long term because of that. Right. We're always going to need energy. And I think we should just assume that we will always need more energy. And and using more energy like you said, Finn, is not the problem, right? It's actually, in fact, a good thing because a high energy life usually means a high quality life. Um, if you see, if you look at the countries that have the lowest energy consumption, they're also, you know, the countries with some of the lowest quality of lives. So what we really need to do is decouple energy consumption from fossil fuel usage, from air pollution. And we can do that through these technologies. Let's dig in on this, actually. I was surprised by this also, that um, energy use is a really strong indicator of quality of life and development. And it's just a sign of things going well, aside from the massive externalities of the fact that you're burning fossil fuels typically to get the energy. But on this point, so there are some people who react to this climate crisis and say, look, we have this crisis because we have massively overconsumed and overproduced. And what is just critical, just central now, is to massively cut back on our energy usage. We need to consume far less. And at the more extreme end, there's this idea of returning to a kind of, you know, natural pre-civilizational state, which is maybe attractive on the face of it, right? Um, so my question is, is there something wrong with that idea? The idea being focusing on cutting back as the solution? And is it possible to have, you know, an abundant society that doesn't just mean also more environmental damage and more tearing up the earth to, you know, make all the shit we don't need? <laughs> so I think there's definitely room for a better use of energy. Um, there are things like efficiency, right? That alone would, would decrease our energy consumption by a little bit. But that alone won't decarbonize our energy system and avoid a climate crisis. And I think it's, a, again, as with everything, it's a combination of all things. Yes, let's reduce a little bit of our energy consumption. Um, but yes, let's, let's build clean, clean energy technologies. And this idea of returning to a pre-civilizational natural state doesn't really resonate with me because I think most people who are saying that don't even know what they're talking about <laughs> nature <laughs> you know nature is beautiful but it is also harsh <laughs> life pre-civilization was hardcore you know people died in like their 40s <laughs> and they didn't have access to to health care and and things that we have now precisely because of our energy consumption right Be precisely because our our the industrial revolution has ignited all, all these other industries and, and have created amazing life-saving technology for humans. There's this great line you mentioned in another podcast you did, I think, uh, to the effect of nobody has ever lived in harmony with nature, but plenty of people have died in harmony with nature. Right. <laughs> and that's the name of the game, right? It's just solving the problems imposed on us by nature. Exactly, exactly. There is no living in harmony with nature. There was just like struggling to survive there was just like women having 10 kids for only one of them to actually survive and make it so there has never been a moment and there there never will be a moment where everything will be peaceful it's almost like the human game is problem solving <laughs> like this is the video game we're in we just have to solve a bunch of problems and and it seems that the more problems we solve the the more complex they become and they just you know, open up the door to all these other different problems that we now have to solve again and again and again. So this idea that, 
oh, we just have to do this one thing and then everything will be great. I think it's a very, um, like, very human narrative. We, we think about that in our lives even, right? Even with things like consumerism. Oh, if I only buy this one pair of jeans, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> and it's, it's so not true. We're, we're constantly dealing with problems and issues. I kind of think as well that you see these two different visions of kind of environmentalism, right? The like more techno optimist version and then like the the kind of degrowth movement. And it always strikes to me as well that it kind of like looks at different ways that people can intervene. Like it's, it's very hard to help um, like encourage the energy transition. Um, like like on an individual level, like I don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, I don't really think there's many like kind of GoFundMes for like nuclear power stations. It's just like much too large. You might like change your own like energy tariff and, and people do, right, to green tariffs. But beyond that, it's, it's like a mostly kind of left up to, to governments and, and policymakers to decide. Whereas this degrowth thing is something that's like very individually accessible. Like you can turn off the light switch, you can stop using plastic bags and you can try and like lower your own carbon footprint a lot easier through that way. But just because it's easier to do on an individual level doesn't mean that it's like our collective solution right and in many ways it is like these more institutional levers that do encourage growth and do encourage increased energy uses just in a greener way um that are better solutions but they're just much harder to access like from an individual standpoint and at least that's what i feel that like a lot of people kind of identify with this degrowth movement more because it's more accessible to them and it's easier to visualize but it might not necessarily actually be the right way to do that yeah i think that individual action has does have a place and you know, we make fun of the plastic straws <laughs> because they don't actually have that big of an impact. But at the end of the day, I think they started a conversation around plastics. Yeah. And yeah. and now we talk about plastics in the ocean and, you know, there is more of an awareness of this problem. And I think that triggers then people to find solutions and better solutions. So I think there is definitely a place for that, but unfortunately that alone won't solve the problem that we're facing right now. And I think that a lot of this philosophy of, of degrowth, one of the things that bothers me the most is that, it, is that it usually comes from people in wealthy nations. It comes from people who have all the privilege of a high energy life, but who now look at the world and say, well, you know, we kind of have used too many resources. We've burned a little bit too much fossil fuels. We, we have to stop. But what they don't understand and what they fail to see is that there is billions of people in the world who don't have the quality of life that they do and that deserve it as much as they do, right? Like one of the most cruel things is inequality around the world and the fact that some people, just because of the place they were born into, will have a miserable existence and will not have access to, to a high quality of life. And, and so I, I really have an issue with people who enjoy the privileges of a high energy life telling other people who were born into poverty and who, and who experience energy poverty that they, that they cannot have those things because, you know, they kind of already used it too much. Um, I have a real issue with that. Yeah, I have absolutely nothing to add. And I feel kind of terrible for cutting this tangent off now. Um, but let's keep talking about nuclear. And let's address this kind of mutant elephant in the room, which is the risks, the dangers of nuclear power. Now, obviously, we have some fairly well known disasters from living history involving nuclear power. And because of them, presumably, when most people think of nuclear energy, they're going to think of green glowing radioactive stuff and generally have this very aversive reaction. So I guess I have loads of questions. Uh, one is, well, how dangerous is nuclear power in fact? So do we have a good idea of how many deaths these disasters cause, for instance? And also, do we have some way of comparing the dangers and harms of nuclear power with other sources of energy? Yeah, so you know, maybe I can talk a little bit about why nuclear energy has this bad reputation. Um, and I think it's because it's hard to disentangle the birth of nuclear energy from nuclear weapons. Um, unfortunately, fission was discovered in 1938, which is just really bad timing. Um, so the first time the world was introduced to nuclear was through bombs testing and then the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which are all really, really dark stains in the history of humankind. So that already obviously makes people wary of the technology and, and rightly so, right? If you're if your association is with bombs, of course you wouldn't want that. Um, 
And then in 1955, the first nuclear power plant started making electricity. And in the 70s, people already started being anxious around nuclear power, and it was mostly due to fear of nuclear war at the time. So a lot of the environmental movement started actually as anti-nuclear war. And then once that fear kind of faded away, it, it was a natural move to merge into anti-nuclear energy. And then in 79, this movie called China Syndrome came out, which is about a nuclear reactor meltdown. And a couple of months after the movie comes out, a partial meltdown happens at the Three Mile Island power plant in Pennsylvania. So, you know, public perception is already not great because this movie comes out and then, boom, this partial meltdown happens, which just confirms people's people's biases that the technology is dangerous. Um, so the meltdown didn't actually kill anyone and there were no adverse health effects caused by the radiation, but that really raised concerns and, and the anti-nuclear movement gained a lot of strength. And then in 86, you have the meltdown at Chernobyl power plant, which was you know a true disaster. Fast forward to 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi power plant had a meltdown after a massive earthquake and tsunami. So all of this sounds terrible, right? <laughs> it's like, oh my God, all these accidents. There's like three major disasters that culminated in evacuation, deaths and suffering. Like this is terrible. But how does it actually compare with other forms of energy production? Well, like I said before, 84% of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels. And burning fossil fuels causes climate change, as we know, but it also causes air pollution. And it's estimated that at least 5 million people die every single year from air pollution, from air pollution-caused diseases. So for nuclear power, the numbers are a little muddy and like hard to confirm. But according to the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Radiation, so far, 51 people have died from radiation exposure from Chernobyl. Um, and that includes the first responders that were there you know, when, when the meltdown ha- happened. While Fukushima has only one confirmed death from radiation exposure, and that's a little bit contested because because they don't know the, the worker died recently, like a couple of years ago, and he was he was a worker at the power plant. So these numbers, I, I want to be clear that these numbers might change, and the estimates vary. And and I also want to you know be mindful that it's not only about deaths. Um, there's a lot of suffering that comes with a disaster like that, with things like evacuation processes and. In the case of Fukushima, um, there were around 3,000 deaths that happened because of the evacuation. So they were not related to radiation exposure, but just because these were people who needed, you know, ventilators or whatever, people who were older and were evacuated in in a rush and just ended up dying. Um, And just the suffering of being displaced. But even considering all of that, you know, this number is still pale in comparison to the number of deaths and other problems caused by burning fossil fuels. And even even when compared to hydropower, nuclear is still safer. So in 1963 in Italy, a dam failed and killed around 1,900 people. And most famously, in 1975, a dam in China collapsed and it killed 85,000 people from, from the flooding. And then you have another one in India in 79 that claimed you know, anywhere between 1,800 to 25,000 people. And there are more accidents like that. So, you know, when compared to these other forms of technology, nuclear is actually pretty safe. Um, and then in, in the case of renewables, I don't, like to, <laughs> I don't like to talk about the data there because it's a little bit sketchy. It's like people who fell from a solar panel, you know, <laughs> or like who jumped off a wind turbine. And it's like, mm, I don't know if I trust that data. But also another thing to consider is that renewables make up a very small share of the world's energy. Um, while hydropower is the largest source of clean energy and, and nuclear is the second largest. So as we as we see more and more renewables being deployed, we might see things happening, although I doubt that, it, that they will be to the level of, you know, a hydropower dam collapse or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And one thing you mentioned earlier as an explanation for these, you know, skewed attitudes toward the risks from nuclear was the availability heuristic, right? And uh, just to say it back, so the idea is that if you give people a, a list of ways they could die and ask them to estimate the relative risks, 
they're going to say that, you know, the risk of dying from a respiratory disease is maybe less than it is. And that the risk of dying from, uh, for instance, a terrorist attack or a shark attack or a plane crash um, are all much higher than they in fact are. Because it's just much easier to bring to mind examples of reading about those things in the news. And the thought here is that, well, all three of the nuclear disasters you mentioned were very prominent in the news and continue to loom large in popular culture. Um, I have in mind a certain HBO miniseries, for instance, and probably like Homer Simpson is maybe not the best ambassador for nuclear safety. But you mentioned these hydropower disasters, which I had no idea about. Why doesn't the same thing apply to them? Why aren't people like, oh my god, hydropower, way too dangerous? Is there something special about nuclear here? Yeah, so I've tried to figure out this before, and I think it's special. Um, it's the fact that it's this thing that can literally kill you if you get too much of it in a short period of time and can cause cancer if you get, um, you know, a moderately high amount of it in a certain amount of time. But yeah, people don't, don't never bring up this, this hydropower collapses and, and failures. And in fact, they've, like I said, they've killed many, many more people than nuclear disasters have. And, and the other thing is that it's not as sexy, <laughs> you know, for a newspaper to report hydropower and fail. It's like, meh, nobody cares. Now, a nuclear reactor meltdown, that's some juicy stuff. And I think a lot of it is because of, again, pop culture is because we've been conditioned since very little that uh, this is what villains do. You know, they get plutonium to make bombs. And I, I think it's just much more interesting um, for a headline. And even now, I mean, it's last March was the 10 year anniversary of Fukushima. And a lot of newspapers actually reported the anniversary by implying that, you know, 16 to 19,000 people died. Um, and the way they made their headlines made it seem like they were they were talking about the nuclear meltdown, when in fact, you know, all of those deaths were caused by by the earthquake and the tsunami, and then also also the evacuation. But they never clarify that, you know, only one person have died from from radiation exposure. So they keep feeding into this this fear, which keeps making it kind of, you know, a more bizarre technology than it, it really is. So I definitely want to put a flag in in touching on like this larger story of, of kind of villains and, and plutonium and, and the like. But one thing I wanted to ask about before that is you mentioned this kind of danger of uh, radiation. And the way we've kind of been talking about nuclear energy at the moment is this risk of uh, kind of a nuclear uh, core meltdown or reactor core meltdown uh, and th this big disaster uh, happening uh, all of a sudden right now. But one of the other ways that people are worried about radiation are the kind of longer term effects. When you uh, use nuclear energy, there's there's some waste being produced. And um, by some accounts, this waste will last for 10,000 uh, years. And we don't really have an idea of, of what that might look like in this uh, incredibly long time scale, what the, the world would look like. And I guess there's concerns that this uh, waste can leak and can cause all sorts of uh, problems. Um, and that definitely is something you, you kind of hear in the discussion as well. Can, can you address uh, that, that point at all? Yeah, so, you know, I think that's one of the downsides of nuclear energy is that it actually creates waste, um, whereas some other forms of energy don't, like solar, wind, and, and hydro. Although, they, you know, they all create different sorts of problems, <laughs> but, but not waste. Um, and then the question I always go back to is like, okay, so we have this problem of having extremely radioactive waste. How does it compare to what we have now? <laughs> and And... The truth is, you know, fossil fuel waste is, again, causing climate change and, and polluting our environment. Whereas nuclear energy waste, actually, because it is so radioactive that, you know, people can die if they touched it. Um, the nuclear energy industry is the only energy generating industry that actually is responsible for disposing of their waste. Um, so when you, you know, when you go to a nuclear power plant, you... If you went into the core, which is not advisable, um, <laughs> but you would see, you know, the fill is this tiny ceramic pellets called uranium pellets, and they're roughly the size of a gummy bear. Um, and inside of the core, you have all these tiny ceramic pellets, which are the thing that, you know, 
fission and then create creates heat and makes steam to spin the turbine and whatever. So once after like four years or so after they've been used to create electricity, they come out as nuclear waste. Now, one thing that I always like to talk about is that nuclear waste, nuclear energy waste, which is different from nuclear weapons waste, but nuclear energy waste is actually solid. So a lot of people think it's liquid. It's like this green goo, like coming coming out of a, a barrel or something. So it's just the same ceramic pellets that went into the reactor come out as waste, what we also call spent fuel. Um, so once they came out of the reactor, they're extremely radioactive and physically hot. So you have to put them inside of a, like a literal pool, a water pool, to cool for a couple of years because um, they keep they keep getting hot from decay heat. So after they come out of the pool, they put them in this giant concrete and metal casks and just drain all the water from the inside and then they shut it down and they literally just put it in like the nuclear power plant's parking lot, especially in the United States because we don't have a permanent um, a permanent disposal site for nuclear energy waste yet. Now, some things that I would like to clarify. Um, again, it's solid, it's not liquid, so it's not like gooing, you know, oozing everywhere. Um, the other thing is that nuclear waste is actually still 94% usable fuel. So some countries already recycle their nuclear waste and reuse it to power nuclear power plants again. And then they get rid of that 4%, which is like a tiny amount. In one of these big concrete casks, you can fit about 3,000 people's life's worth of electricity, um, which is just a lot. And then if you reprocess that, you would get an even smaller amount of waste that you really have to get rid of. And, and the other thing I always like to talk about is that we once had a natural nuclear reactor on Earth. Um, it was in Gabon. It was called Oklo. And it just so happened that this cave had all of the magic ingredients to create a nuclear power plant. <laughs> and it did. Engineers think that it, it actually created energy for, for a long time. Um, not like an insane amount of energy, but it did. So the other thing that we can observe is that this natural, n- natural nuclear reactor also created waste. And when you analyze the waste, it it's just sitting there. <laughs> you know, it's just sitting there underground. It didn't move anywhere. It didn't go up to the soil. It didn't poison anything. It didn't poison anyone. It was just sitting there underground, decaying away. Um, and the other thing that is good about reprocessing and reusing the waste as energy is that you decrease the amount of time that this waste will be radioactive for. So without reprocessing, the waste is radioactive for tens of thousands of years. And with reprocessing, it goes down to something like 500 years. 